Freedom, who's going to tell us about an approach to assignment today. Okay, thank you. It's a um, great pleasure to be back in Montreal. So, with a um, postdoc in Montreal uh, many decades ago, uh, I taught uh, one course in French, um, and I still remember the teaching evaluation, which said, um, uh, Francais minimal. Okay, so that's my experience of teaching in French. Um, okay, so um, perhaps I'll put them. Um, the conjecture here. So first of all, everything I say here is a joint um, with um, Wolfgang Lück, who some of you will know. And so the following conjecture, which uh, goes back uh, to uh, John Simon, Jonathan, Jonathan Simon. So I think in the late 70s, let's say 79, I think it appears in one of these Kirby lists of problems. Um, and uh, it's easy to state them. Um, so um, mm, let uh, k j in S3 be not if um, there exists. Um, so pi k is going to be a shorthand for the not group, meaning it's um, pi one of uh, S3 minus k. And so um, um, if there exists an epimorphism of um, pi one of the not group minus k, um, pi one of um, complement of J, um, then the genus of K is greatly equal to the genus of J. And so the genus of a knot is, so like as, um, I guess most of you know, so every knot um, bounds a surface, and the minimal surface, um, the minimal genus of a surface bound in K is called the genus of K. Okay, so it's a um, simple state. Um, if there exists an epimorphism between the fundamental groups um, of a knot complement of K and J, then the genus of K has to be greater than genus of J. Okay. And so we're talking about paper which appeared the last year, was written a couple of years earlier. And uh, now, of course, since 2022, um, the world moved forward. Um, we now have uh, Chat GPT. And actually, today, so I went to Chat GPT and um, asked what we can prove from um, this conjecture. And uh, yes, we can. And um, Okay, so the key sentence is following. Okay, by a result known as Stallings theorem, the genus of a knot is closely related to its knot group. Specifically, now that's Stallings theorem, which you might not have known. So specifically, if the genus of a knot is a G, then its knot group has a presentation with the G generators and one relation. <laughs> Okay, little known theory of Stallings. I mean, I always knew he was very smart, but he didn't know he could prove that statement. Okay, so um, so there was a chat GPT some um, um, attempt. Um, uh, okay, so let's uh, try um, something else. Um, um, okay, now um, uh, what uh, could you do? Well, uh, so you hear, hear two keywords. You hear um, a fundamental group um, and you hear um, a genus. Um, and there's uh, one uh, mathematical object which most of you will know, which relates um, not group um, and a genus, um, namely the Alexander polynomial. So it can perhaps remind you of the Alexander polynomial. So let uh, uh, K in S3 be a not. Uh, and um, now, one of the nice things about the Alexander polynomial is it has many different um, definitions. Um, and um, perhaps I'll give you two definitions. Um, so um, one which um, um, is the following. So you can look um, at um, the so-called uh, Alexander module. So what's happening? So if you want, um, I remind you, so uh, H1 of S3 minus K is isomorphic to Z. Um, so you can look at the intrinsically covering and then um, that's um, um, its homology is a module of um, the group ring of Z. Um, and if you look with the rational coefficients, um, it's a module of um, Q3 inverse. Um, Q3 inverse is a PID. So you can write that as a direct sum of a cyclic modules. And uh, then the Alexander polynomial, if you want, you can define it as a product um, of these uh, cyclic, um, these guys here. That's not the most standard definition, but in a way, it's the shortest definition using a um, general machine from algebraic uh, topology. Look at infinitely covering, look at it as a module of Q3 inverse, 
apply um, structure theorem and take these um, guys here, take the product them. So um, a second definition, um, which perhaps um, is more um, common, is the following. So you can say it's um, you can um, define using a cipher matrix. Um, so that's a determinant a t minus a transpose, um, where a is a cipher matrix. Um, so if you know what's a cipher matrix, good. And if not, it doesn't really matter. Um, but what, um, the only thing you have to know is um, so I was saying every node um, is the boundary of the surface. It's called the ciphered surface. Um, and um, on the homology of that surface, you can define a form which gives you the cipher matrix. In particular, here, um, the size um, of A is given um, by twice the genus um, of um, a ciphered surface. Okay, so it's uh, one of two of the many, many definitions um, of um, the Alexander polynomial. Okay, and um, now well, what can we say about the Alexander polynomial? So, let me remind you of a few facts. Um, so um, one is um, that um, the degree of the Alexander polynomial is less or equal than twice the genus of K. And that's um, with what I wrote down, not very hard to see, because um, let's say, let's take a second definition here. I was saying here, A comes from a cipher surface. Um, let's say it has a genus G, then um, A, is a matrix of um, size 2G by 2G with um, integer entries. Um, and so if you have here um, a 2G by 2G matrix with integer entries, um, that's a 2G by 2G matrix um, with um, in entries um, one basically linear in T. And then it's basically an elementary linear algebra to see that uh, the degree of that polynomial is at most 2G. So it follows easily from that um, definition. Okay, so easy. Mm, another way perhaps um, of um, formulating the degree of the Alexander polynomial is um, as follows. If we, um, is to just say, well, let's, if we look at the first definition here. So here H one of S three minus K Q T inverse. Um, and um, now that's a perfectly fine rational um, um, vector space. Um, you can just take um, its um, rational homology and its um, uh, dimension. And that's really just um, it's, um, just follows immediately from here. The degree of the polynomial of the PI is exactly the same as rational dimension of um, that quotient. Them. So nothing fancy. Okay. And um, perhaps a third statement um, <clears throat> is um, the following. So if K is a phi, but not, um, so let me remind you what that means. Um, so that just means, um, i.e., you look at S3 minus K, you look to not complement them, and that is a surface bundle over S1. Surface bundle uh, over S1. Then mm, the degree of the Alexander polynomial is uh, given by, okay, so if you have a surface bundle over S1, here, um, I was saying this object here is just um, the um, homology of the corresponding infinitely covering, which is, but the infinitely covering of a surface bundle is just a surface uh, times R. And so what you get here using two is uh, the degree of the Alexander polynomial is exactly the genus um, of um, the fiber. Okay, so the genus, uh, twice genus. And, um, which is uh, equal to twice the genus of K. And um, why is that? Um, well, basically, okay, I'll we'll argue for a second. Um, so, um, okay, you have to think a little bit for a second that um, the fiber here is a cipher surface. So you get one inequality and the other inequality comes from one. Yeah. So here it requires a little argument, um, but um, yes. So for um, a fiber not, um, the Alexander polynomial knows the genus. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, okay, so I asked chat GPT again. And um, so I asked, it, so I'm a dear chat GPT, can you prove uh, Simon's conjecture using the Alexander polynomial? And it did give him um, not such a bad argument. Um, so it's, man should not underestimate chat GPT. So um, let me prove the following uh, lemma. 
Mm. Well, perhaps that's immediately stop with the proof. Um, <laughs> then let's see. Um, then I'll tell you where the chat GPT is screwed up, but it did prove something in a way. So um, if um, okay, so we are start here with the hypothesis that we have an epimorphism of pi k into pi j. Uh, then okay, so um, well, okay, so um, I guess uh, as uh, um, most of us know, so if you want to compute um, a first homology and also with whatever coefficients um, of um, proper space, um, it's completely determined by its fundamental group. Um, so in particular, if you have an epimorphism on um, uh, fundamental groups, um, what you get is um, you get an epimorphism of um, these um, Alexander modules. Um, so if you get uh, S3 minus K, so that there's nothing really to do with my particular situation. It's just general nonsense about them. Um, pi one determining H one. So you get here an epimorphism. Okay, and um, what does that do for me? So um, um, I was saying that um, the degree of the Alexander polynomial equals um, the dimension of um, um, this module here. So if you have an epimorphism. From here to here, evidently the dimension here has to be greater equal to the dimension here. So what we get is that the degree, I've already put it here, degree of um, the Alexander polynomial of uh, T is uh, greater equal than degree of the Alexander polynomial of J. So that just follows from that. And um, what else do we get for free? So we said um, that is, um, um, so we have this inequality. So here we have uh, twice the genus of K. Okay. And um, now we would like um, to put a genus of J here. Twice some um, say, And um, okay, the, um, the one bit where ChatGPT um, error was by saying that here you always have an equality. But we know we have equality only if um, J is tri bottom. Okay, so if J is tri bottom. Okay, so here lemma. Uh, so um, uh, let me say C, SC, Simon's conjecture holds um, if um, mm, J is tri bottom. Or more generally, if um, the Alexander polynomial of uh, J determines the genus. For example, like it's also true if J is some um, alternating. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. But um, anyway, I mean, except for that, um, Chat GPT got it right. It's not pretty impressive in a way. Um, I mean, you can have lots of fun with uh, Chat GPT, and like you can then ask, uh, can you prove it um, using not homology? Not many not homology people here. So Chat GPT can prove it using not homology. Uh, you can ask it, can it prove it using a Jones polynomial? Then it says, no, you cannot do it because Jones polynomial is not related to the genus. Um, okay, not bad. Um, then you ask whether you can prove it using Corvano homology. And lo and behold, you can prove it. Um, um, you, you can ask it whether you can prove it using hyperbolic geometry. There are lots of hyperbolic geometers here. Yes, you can do it. Um, uh, yes. Um, you can ask it for a proof um, in the rhymes. You can also do that. Um, um, it, uh, you can ask, you ask for the shortest proof, um, and then it just says, um, using topological considera considerations, we get the inequality. Uh, <laughs> I used the one which I got this morning. Like, it was this morning, I went online on chat GPT and um, whatever, ai.blogspot, whatever. That's what I got um, as a response. <laughs> <laughs> It would be worth doing this. Um, anyway, um, okay. So, um, I mean, in, in a way, um, this some um, proof, this some um, approach here, is um, very appealing. And um, the only reason why it fails is because of the Alexander polynomial does not always detect the genus. Um, okay. Now, um, people have been um, around them. Um, know that I like to talk about generalizations of the um, Alexander polynomial. And uh, for example, there's something called the twisted Alexander polynomial. Now I did a very bad job with my. Um, can we flip this? No. Um, <laughs> bad job with my head. 
Um, I put it here. Uh, you did a horrible job. Okay, I apologize. Okay, so um, definition. So um, let um, alpha from pi k to a G L N C B a representation. Then um, we can consider H one of S three minus K. And um, now you can look at um, twisted homology with um, like CN coefficients and because pi one of um, S three minus K acts on CN, so you get twisted homology. And you still have your um, C T to the inverse um, coming from the stabilization. So you get uh, something called a um, twisted Alexander module. If you have never seen it, then the, the, just okay, it's nothing fancy. It's just total nonsense. Um, and uh, so you get some twisted Alexander module, and then that's again a module over C to the inverse. So you can play the same game as uh, here, and you just write as a sum of cyclic modules, um, and you take uh, these guys here, take the product, um, and that's called a twisted Alexander polynomial. Okay, so I get here. Let me just say delta k alpha. Um, of t, so that's um, um, a twisted extended polynomial, which depends on your choice of representation. Okay, and um, now I made a living out of um, studying these um, twisted extended polynomials, um, and um, in a way, um, it has many properties very similar um, to ordinary extended polynomials. Um, so, for example, it also gives you a lower bound um, on the not genus. Um, and um, perhaps I'll just um, modify my statements here. Um, so here, if you have a representation um, n-dimensional, then um, um, okay, there's going to be a slight cheat. Um, so put it in quotes, um, but it's a model statement um, that um, so here you have an um, n-dimensional representation, and um, naively speaking, your the degree goes up by a factor of you might by degree by n, roughly speaking. And um, that's why he, um, you normally get a lower bound on the twice the genus, but um, you have to factor in the n. There's a little error term which I'm not talking about. Um. But with the proof of the yeah. and polynomial over C? Yes, yes, a polynomial over uh, complex numbers, yes. Okay. Uh, and here should be a little careful. So uh, if um, this um, twisted extended polynomial is non zero. Okay. And. Um, Otherwise, um, so here uh, that uh, also holds um, and uh, that uh, also holds. Um, so if you have a five but not, um, then the twisted extended polynomial also gives you the um, um, fiber and the genus. Um, again, a little error term, which we will not talk about them. Um. Okay, and that's um, uh, so I um, wrote the paper with a take in almost 20 years ago. Um, it's not super fancy. You have to be a little bit careful with the twisted coefficients, but um, nothing particularly deep. Um, okay. Um, a little more interesting, perhaps, uh, is the theorem which I put here, because of my, well, here, because of my horrible blackboard management. Um, um, okay, so... Um, mm, okay, so the thing is... Um, uh, you're never supposed to talk about genus. You're always supposed to talk about oligocharistic. Um, and you're never supposed to talk about um, first homology. You're supposed to talk about um, right mass torsion and basically the error term. So the correct statement is um, here you have to look at um, um, oligocharistic or first, yeah, oligocharistic. Um, and here you're supposed to look um, not only at H1, but also at H0. Um, so you get an um, uh, error term coming from a twisted H0. It's very small, but it's there. Okay, um, now, so there's a following theorem, which um, goes back to proof with uh, Stefano Medusi, 2012, perhaps. Um, so given any K, there exists um, a representation alpha such that um, here um, equality holds um, such a the degree of the twisted extended polynomial um, equals modulo the error term by n times the genus of k. Okay, let me say something about the proof. Um, so the proof um, uses um, this fantastic theorem 
of uh, Danny Weiss, uh, Ian Agel, um, also Pschitzky Weiss, um, that um, if um, if you have um, any um, three manifold, um, let's say not a closed graph manifold, but a pain, um, and if you take um, any um, surface or any um, first cohomology class, um, there will exist um, um, a finite covering such that um, this um, class um, can be approximated by fiber classes. Um. So it's virtual fibering theorem in its um, um, strongest form. And actually, um, I should also mention that. So this theorem also had an origin in uh, Montreal because um, in 2006, I guess it was talking to Genevieve in a uh, coffee shop um, in Montreal. And I said, uh, it, would be, it would be really cool um, if somebody could prove um, uh, that um, if you have um, taken um, any homology classes, three manifold, um, there exists a finite covering such that it can be approximated by a finite coverings, by, fi by fiber classes. Um, and then uh, Genevieve uh, pointed out to me that's exactly what um, Ian had uh, proved. Um, that um, if you are if you're reverse, um, then um, you can take any um, homology class and um, find a finite covering so you can approximate it by um, a fiber um, classes. Um. And then afterwards, it was proved by famously by um, Danny and um, Egel, um, also um, uh, Manning and um, ach, Groves, sorry, <laughs> and uh, um, Pschiditsky, uh, that um, if you have, um, for example, like not complement them, uh, fundamental groups um, or um, uh, reverse them. And then uh, basically uh, all we uh, had to do is uh, we had to take uh, that statement that you take, um, for example, a cipher surface, just to find a covering, so that you can approximate it by a fiber class system, um, combine it um, with um, that for fiber classes, everything is easy, um, and a little bit of um, algebraic massaging, you get uh, the result. Um, so it's, um, it's a nice little paper from um, Stephanie and mine, but it's basically 95% uh, or 98% um, um, just using cleverness um, of um, other people. Why, why can you pass the cover if you want? Um, Alexander Palomino, the original outcome. Um, it's basically okay. So if you take, uh, okay, so where does the representation come from? It's um, okay. So you have um, um, a finite covering, and um, in the finite covering, we uh, take um, 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 cleverly chosen one-dimensional representation, and so you have a finite like, subgroup with a one-dimensional representation, and uh, the representation here is uh, the induced representation. So any the index of the cover. Again? The dimension of the representation and the exactly, um, the exactly, um. and so this is for, for specific alpha. But if, if you increase and if you take uh, an I don't know high to infinity, then this does it become generic that you have the quality? Ah, um, keep the question okay. Um, okay, now, um, okay, now with that the theorem in mind, um, we can go back uh, to um, a good old um, Simon's conjecture. And see how we're doing, and in a way, it looks like um, very good. Um, so, um, okay, let's go back. So we have an epimorphism on fundamental groups, and um, now for the not J, I take um, a representation to a GLNC alpha um, such that um, here I get um, equality. Okay, so here that theorem says. Um, I can find a um, representation such that here I get equality. And um, now here's my representation. Now let's give it a name here. It's called the phi. Then I get an induced uh, representation on uh, K. I can just go from with phi to pi J with alpha to a GLN C. And um, now the fact that you have an epimorphism here, again, translates with some um, massaging into an epimorphism on these um, twisted um, Alexander modules. That's a correct statement. Um, and um, yes, yeah, so now, so now here have to develop my, so here now, of course, we have to continue, yes. Yeah, so, so now here, um, okay, so let's see. So we have an epimorphism from here to here. So that um, should mean that um, this degree is bigger and um, um, as I was saying that um, twist Alexander polynomials some um, always give you low bound on genus. Um, so uh, here an N. Ah, oh, we're done. Ooh, ah, ah, uh -huh. um, I was always tempted to um, um, submit that paper, um, like that proof um, in the paper to a journal and see what I can get to. 
Okay. Um, so it's just if it divide by n, and I got my inequality. Does anybody see a mistake? What? what, what? Number one, they have some scare quotes. No, this, no, that's not a problem. That's not a problem. No, no, that's not a problem. Yeah, it, 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 yeah, it doesn't really matter. Yeah. Okay, but of course here, okay, there's a moment of quotes, but also that condition here, and that's what um, screws up everything. So you have an um, epimorphism from here to here. That's a correct statement. And uh, this um, being non-zero, I guess perhaps I didn't quite say it, um, is um, the same as uh, that being finite dimensional. If uh, this fellow here is um, infinite dimensional, you're screwed. And um, so it's um, so it's true that um, this polynomial divides that polynomial, but um, everything divides zero. Okay, so that's why that approach that doesn't work. Um, okay, so it's um, super appealing in a way because um, just um, um, upgrade this um, to get um, equality here. But uh, what you need um, to do is um, you, um, you still have to ensure that that is non-zero. So why non-zero? And um, in a way, that's a new question from before. Um, like um, if you take um, a knot, um, this knot here, and you take a representation which comes from the right hand side, um, um, in a way, you have to be seriously unlucky for this to be um, zero, uh, non zero. S zero. <laughs> so, um, uh, generically, if you look at twisted Alexander polynomials, they should be um, non zero. And um, but there's no reason how you can prove it right now. And if somebody has an idea um, to make this approach work, um, talk to me. But um, it seems to be a serious problem. Anyway, so we need um, um, a different idea. Or at least um, we have to make um, like um, we have to modify this idea. It's not a horrible idea, but we have to somehow try to come up with an idea to make it work, um, at least in some setting. And um, what I want to talk about is um, so here before for ordinary extended polynomials, um, I was already using a little bit, namely I was using uh, that uh, ordinary extended polynomials are always non-zero. Okay, everybody knows that. Um, but it's perhaps worth thinking about them. Um, why are ordinary extended polynomials of knots non-zero? What's, like, what's a good reason why they're non-zero? And uh, there are many proofs, but I want to give you one proof um, which um, perhaps is uh, one of the most conceptual proofs. Um, and um, perhaps now I can I'll just erase everything here. If you got confused about twisted extended polynomials, it will not appear again. So you can just um, uh, enter the conversation again. <laughs> yeah, so let's try to prove um, um, the following lemma. So um, the ordinary extended polynomial is um, non zero. Okay. Um, I mean, usually one would go through the definition of through with some cipher matrix. Let me give you a different proof. Um, so, a proof. Um, okay. So, um, I look at um, S3 minus K and I look at the map from S1. To S3 minus K, which just corresponds to the meridian. So I just think of a meridian as one sitting at S3 minus K. And um, note um, so uh, if you look at uh, relative homology, that is actually a zero. It's basically because the meridian generates H1. So here, uh, if you look at the relative homology, it's um, zero. And now, Mm, I want to use the following little claim. So um, let um, A be a matrix um, over the integers. Um, no, sorry, over apologies, over Z to the inverse, such that um, A T equals one is invertible. Then um, the um, matrix has a property that multiplication by one by a is some um, monomorphism. Okay, let me first repeat the claim and I'll tell you what what it has to do with our story. So it's completely it's a pure algebra, nothing fancy. 
we have a, a matrix over that inverse square matrix um, and let's say it has a property that if you plug in t equals one it becomes invertible say the term is one then um, this um, matrix has a property that the multiplication by the matrix um, is a monomorphism and the proof is um, um, basically trivial because um, um, take your matrix a um, take its determinant and since uh, taking the determinant um, commutes with the ring of morphisms, it doesn't matter whether you first uh, plug in t equals one, and then take the determinant, um, or whether you first take the term, we with it first, what? Got confused. Um, anyway, it's it's really just um, a fact that um, it doesn't matter whether you first um, take the determinant or plug in t equals one. So it's elementary. And um, what does it have to do with our story? So. Um, We'll see later why um, I put this claim here. So, um, uh, if you look at, um, well, let's say you look at the relative um, um, cellular chain complex of S3 minus K, you take a one zero cell, and um, let's say here S3 minus K, I'm just um, collapse it to um, two complex. Um, you basically see um, the, the relative chain complex, you can assume it has just um, two cells and one cell. So, and then um, it's, you get a square matrix. Um, and if you work um, over um, that three inverse coefficients, um, you basically just get a square matrix um, over um, that three inverse. And the fact that the relative homology over that um, is a trivial just means that if you take this square matrix here with t equals one, it becomes invertible. And now we learned that, that um, oh, this matrix over that three inverse um, is um, monomorphism. In particular, you get the H1 of S3 minus K, S1 with QT coefficients is a zero because um, the boundary matrix is given by A. And then if it's um, injective as that inverse, um, it becomes an isomorphism of QT. But then if you look here at the long exact sequence um, of S3 minus K and S1, you get that H1 of S3 minus K with some um, QT coefficients is isomorphic to H1 of S1 with QT coefficients, but that is clearly zero. So um, if the relative homology is zero, then these two have the same homology groups. Um, for S1, it's um, easy to calculate them. So you see that um, if you not group them um, with these rational, um, like rational field coefficients here, um, is zero, which means that uh, over Q to the inverse, it's torsion. A little complicated, but um, it's an argument which works um, in um, greater generality. <clears throat> okay. Um, you learned that in greater generality, but not only is the polynomial not zero, but the state non zero is whether it's two equals one. Mm. Say again. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Yes, yeah, 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 um, I'll tell them uh, the young kids some um, um, uh, good trick. Um, so um, if there's a conjecture which you cannot solve, um, you do the following. You first you generalize it, and then you prove a different special case which potentially is disjoint from your original conjecture. Okay, good trick. Um, so um, um, whenever you hear, hear a conjecture about not genus, um, the um, obvious generalization is um, to go from a not and the genus. Um, to a general three minifolds um, and the um, first norm. If you don't know what's the first norm, it's just basically uh, measuring minimal um, genus, say, of surfaces representing second homology classes. Um. Okay, so um, let's um, try to formulate the um, um, conjecture. So um, let um, M and B three minifolds um, and um, Let's say we have an epimorphism from pi one m to pi one n epimorphism. That um, okay, I put something here afterwards. Um, so um, the, then for any phi in H upper one and z, um, we have um, okay. So here um, x um, n phi. So X is my notation for first norm. So X and phi just means, um, so H upper one is represented by, by a point that corresponds to surface to a class in H2, the boundary. And you take some, 
minimal genus of that um, surface um, slide sheet. But that's just, um, um, you just look at the minimal genus of surfaces um, representing that homology class in N. And now you can take uh, this class here, oh, two feet is very bad. Uh, you can pull it um, back um, and you get a um, homology class um, in M. And you can look uh, at, um, again, the minimal genus in M. And you can ask whether um, you have that inequality. And um, turns out, um, as it stands, the conjecture is um, wrong. Um, so um, wrong. Again? Ah, can chat with you. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's um, wrong. It's um, an example I learned with um, from Yilu. It was very simple in a way. So. Um, for example, like just do the following. Take um, S1 times the surface. Then uh, from surface, you go to um, from pi one of S1 times the surface. Um, you go to pi one of the surface. Um, you go to um, a free group. Um, and then it's easy to get even more systems onto a knot group. Um, and then here you get genus. And here the pullback will be represented by um, a torus um, will be um, first number zero. So as it stands, um, it's not correct. Um, but um, what um, we really learned here a little bit is like, a, it's good to have some um, isomorphisms on ordinary homology. And so um, I put here an X condition, namely I want that um, the induced map on H1 of M with the integer coefficients is an isomorphism. Seems a little bit random, but um, it excludes my count example. And um, now looks all right. Okay, so uh, it's a little weird this condition here. Um, but now, it's um, a generalization of um, this conjecture here. Also, I should say, um, if M and N are closed, um, this conjecture just follows um, fairly easily from um, Gabay's theorem that um, Kromov norm equals first norm. But uh, it's uh, basically it has only content um, if you have many folds with boundary. Okay. And um, perhaps let me now state um, the theorem that the Wolfgang and I can prove. Um, how am I doing on time? Okay, excellent. Okay, I think I will finish before that. Okay, so uh, um, so the best theorem that or best statement that um, Wolfgang and I can prove in that direction is the following. So um, um, the conjecture um, uh, holds um, if um, pi one n is okay now comes a um, mouthful perhaps um, um residually mm, residually uh, okay now parenthesis some um, amenable uh, uh, elementary amenable excuse me amenable and um, locally integrable. Okay, so um, before I explain uh, the adjectives, um, perhaps let me just say a corollary, which is easy to state them. Um, so conjecture holds um, if um, n is um, fibered. Okay, let's um, think whether um, the corollary here is actually meaningless or not. Um, so um, um, the corollary says, um, so if you have um, two, three manifolds, um, if um, n is a fiber, um, then for any homology class here, you get um, this um, inequality. And um, having this inequality is basically trivial if you start out here with a fiber class. It's the same argument from before. But um, if n is fiber, then we'll have fiber classes and we'll have lots of non fiber classes. And for the non fiber classes, um, um, it seems to be a, a non trivial statement. Um, so it's a little subtle, but um, it, it's basically, um, so it has content. Mm -hmm. Relief. Okay, um, now, okay, so I guess now I have to tell you what I mean by elementary amenable and locally indicable and why they arise. Um, um, elementary amenable, well, it's basically a group which is built out of um, finite groups um, and um, so would groups same. Um, let's not say more about it. For example, like, um, if you're finding a subgroup which is um, solvable, you're elementary amenable. 
Um, locally indicable is um, uh, the following. Ah, yes. Um, also, perhaps I should again say what I mean by parentheses here. So, um, if I have a property of a um, group P, a group G is called residually P. If uh, for every non trivial element there exists a um, homomorphism to a group which has this property P, such as my element gets sent to something non trivial. For example, like many of you will have heard about residually finite. So, um, every non trivial element um, uh, appears in a um, uh, finite quotient. And um, here it's a more of a mouthful. So every element uh, can be seen in um, a quotient, which is um, elementary amenable and um, locally integrable. Yes, exactly. So here, yeah. Okay, so what's locally indicable definition? So G is locally indicable if um, any finitely generate subgroup um, H um, of a G non trivial admits an epimorphism onto that. Um, sounds a bit weird, um, but for example, let's say um, um, free abelian group um, is locally indicable. Free group is locally indicable. And um, um, nice theorem in free manifold topology, which goes back to um, Howie, different Howie, um, older Howie, um, that um, if you have a um, free manifold um, with a B1 greater than zero, it's uh, locally indicable. Anyway, um, why do we care about people? It's um, because I claim here. So um, the statement here, in a way, you can ask them in general, like if, um, let's say you have a group of G. Again? Oh, okay, sorry. Let's do it in better. So let's say you have a group G. You have um, a matrix um, over um, the group ring. And um, let's say uh, you um, just um, do the um, um, augmentation, whatever. The map which sends every element in G to a triple element. The right here, G equals one. So you have a matrix over group ring. And if you just go to the integers, um, for whatever reason you know, it's um, invertible. Um, does it mean? And there's a question mark here. Uh, does it imply that um, over your Richard group ring, um, this map here is a monomorphism? And um, it's um, a theorem, I guess, again, due to um, Howie, Schneebelli, who I never met, um, and uh, Gersten, that um, this statement holds um, if uh, G is locally indicable. The locally indicable is um, a great property because it lets you um, upgrade um, information about the integers, which is easy to obtain, uh, to the group ring. So locally indicable is great. Um, and, um, okay. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So um, I have to say, yeah. If this property holds for any fine generic subgroup, then it holds for the group. And uh, indicable. Um, okay, sorry. Uh, you want it for every finite general subgroup. Um, and I guess um, um, the logic of must be like, yeah, you have a matrix and you look at the entries, it gives you a finite general subgroup, um, and then you want something. And then we look at the proof, but um, some is unreasonable. Okay, um, so how do we prove the theorem? Um, while I asked the chat GPT, uh, via chat GPT, can one prove um, Simon's conjecture using L2 invariants? Um, and then the chat GPT says, no, you cannot use L2 invariants. Um, to um, prove Simon's conjecture, but one can prove um, that the theorem here. And um, uh, if you don't know uh, what are L2 invariants, um, um, so I remember a couple of years ago, perhaps I don't know, seven, eight years ago, for some birthday conference, um, I think for Wolfgang Luck uh, or Rensky in, um, in Münster in Germany. So um, um, Danny Weiss was giving um, a talk of, about um, whatever. And then somebody asked him, um, whether one can use L2 invariants uh, to prove the same statement. And then Danny Weiss walked up to Wolfgang Luck and said, um, L2 invariants are voodoo. <laughs> I know what the Danny remembers. So, um, so L2 invariants are a little bit of voodoo. Um, 
but it can be quite powerful. And um, so, okay, so um, we use some L2 invariants. Um, I will not go um, into um, details, um, um, but perhaps um, I'll uh, say, uh, do I want to say something? Um, so, um, so one thing we show is, um, so um, if you have, um, if you have a three minifold, and if you have a class um, of p in h over one, you can look at the corresponding um, intrinsically covering. You can look at it um, as L2 Betty number. And it turns out um, that is the same as the first norm of phi. It's a little bit like um, before I was saying the um, degree of the Alexander polynomial corresponds to a dimension of the first homology of the intrinsic covering. And um, instead, um, we, again, we go to the intrinsic covering, but uh, we don't look at the order homology. We look um, at its uh, two many numbers. Um, and it turns out um, um, now you actually get um, um, an inequality. And uh, so in a way, we want now, at that point, we want to play the same scheme as before, uh, which I wrote down here with Alexander polynomials. Um, and so if you have an uh, epimorphism here, again, uh, you want to say, um, so you, here, L2B number of uh, n with pi one of n coefficients gives you the first norm. Now you have to control l to numbers of the infinitely cover of, covering of m, but with coefficients given by pi one of n. And at that point, um, um, you need um, uh, this condition here, plus the claim to uh, control the uh, l to numbers um, of um, m. And let me perhaps just um, um, finish um, with um, a conjecture. And um, okay, so here the conjecture is the following that um, if um, b1 of n is greater than zero, uh, then so if you give me a conjecture, um, you have a three manifold, b1 is greater than zero, then um, it has its residually that. Um, and I don't know whether I believe the conjecture or not, um, but it's also um, um, something I learned from Cameron Gordon. So he at some point said um, he always decides things as conjectures, um, not as um, questions, because then for a student, it's much better to say he disproved the conjecture of him than to say he disproved the question of him. So um, um, if you have a solution to that conjecture, um, please uh, talk to me. Okay, thank you. Um, still, does uh, like being reefers imply this? Um, yes, I guess reefers is a good. Um, so it's always, it's just like um, up to find covers. It's kind of annoying. Like the three infolds virtually they have this property. So um, uh, if you're reefers and you get all these nice sober quotients um, um, and then they um, have that property. So um, uh, virtually it's true. Um, three infold groups um, with P1 greater than zero are locally indicable. But it's this funny combination of um, you want to have, you want to control too many things at once, um, and we don't. I don't know how to do it. Um, which is annoying. Yes. I'm trying to derive the corollary from the theorem. What do you do with a group element that's in the five percent? Okay, it's not in the five percent if you just project the zero. Okay, well, that's why we need this condition here. Yeah. How do you? Oh, 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 I see. Oh, oh, it's just um. No, it's uh, so if you have a, a five, but it's not hard um. To see that that, that condition holds them um, because um, you just take um, so if you're five atom, you're a symmetric product of that with um, a surface group or a free group, um, then for the free group um, or a surface group, you just take your derived series. Um, these are nice torsion free um, so will be groups, um, and then um, you get them, um, you get these all these, uh, and then you just take them as that symmetric product. Um, um, a free group um, modulo, it's an nth derived group, um, and then you get very nice um, um, torsion free um, so we'll the subgroups. Um, that's why it works for um, phi button. Yeah? Um, yeah, so locally and typically means torsion free, yes. Um, and we, um not sure this could be list but it's just, for example like uh, not groups um or um never um, except for the triple group um for except for the triple not um 
not come to another to the Liam um, um, portion for any potent or not. Because they note an important question is except the ones um, which factor through um, a Z. That's actually a correct proof. Of, uh, that's a correct theorem of a Stolling sum. So if, if um, all three manifolds cause the first bag number, are yeah. does that imply Simon's Yes. It was basically, it, it, so it implies that conjecture which gives you that conjecture. So if you can show that this condition here holds for not groups, um, you get Simon's conjecture, but I don't see what not groups um, helps you in any sense. Um.